After emancipation, one of the pushes was to develop public schools in the city, and so William Finch was one of the main people that was behind that. The tragedy of the story is that his own children couldn't benefit from it when they initially started the public school system that he helped to initiate. Um, he, he was still paying out of pocket to get them educated. And, and he continued to fight to make sure eventually, you know, uh, there were public schools for all students and not just white students. I think especially as it relates to this community, I think it's crucial for this community to know like what an important role one of their own heroes and legends played in the development of the Atlanta public school system. Vision is a powerful gift to possess. We are all born with it. The ability to see a future that is substantially different than our current circumstances. For a man born into enslavement in Wilkes County, Georgia, 1832, the ability to have a vision, to see far into the future, nearly 200 years perhaps, and to see a school, a public school bearing his name, William Finch Elementary. Well, one has to believe that a divine hand played a role in that vision coming to fruition. At the beginning of 1870, the radical Republicans regained control of the Georgia legislature. Now, knowing full well that this would cause a backlash with the Democratic Party and their emotional loyalty to the failed Confederacy, they initiated a rapid series of bills to try and maintain the progress promised by Reconstruction. One of these bills initiated the pre-war practice of allowing a people of a specific district or ward the ability to select their own representatives for that ward. Those of us who were affiliated with the radicals knew that the people of the second, third, and fourth wards had a predominantly black constituency, and the radicals agreed to support any black city candidates who decided to run for office. By December of 1870, alongside my fellow incumbent George Graham representing the third ward, I became one of the first Negro city councilmen in the city of Atlanta, representing the fourth ward. Now that was some victory. But it was also the beginning of a very difficult, lifelong journey. See, back then as a councilman, we only had one year in office. So the objective was to put all of your energy behind one single piece of legislation. I decided to focus on public schooling for all. Now the critics of public schooling said that there would have to be a high amount of taxes to build and maintain the schools. The way that the Freedmen's Bureau was establishing black schools in the South proved that theory to be erroneous. We would just have to establish something like the Bureau on a citywide level. But the unspoken fears of the critics were really twofold. One, they would have to contend with an educated, poor, white, and Negro labor class who would invariably demand a fair wage. And two, the blurring of class distinctions that education would initiate would eventually lead to the blurring of social boundaries. In other words, the good old fear of miscegenation, it is ever present. As part of my job as city councilman, it was imperative that I assuage the erroneous fears and unspoken theories. That's a lot to do in just one year. In many ways, I was successful. I was able to pass a measure that would allow us to establish the first set of public schools in the city. For that measure, posterity has designated me the father of Atlanta public schools. <laughs> it is something to be proud of. But there's also a shadow to that designation. Well, you see, uh, my own children were unable to attend the schools that I fathered. You see, that's how visions usually work. In 1872, a year after I left office, we were able to petition the city government to establish the first Negro grammar schools in the city. It would be another 52 years until the state of Georgia got its first public high school for Negroes. Booker T. Washington in 1924. You see, 
after I left office with George Graham as the first Negroes on city council, there would not be another Negro public official in the city of Atlanta until May 13, 1953, with Rufus E. Clement, A.T. Walden, and Dr. Miles Amos. Three Negro men, 82 years later. That's how being a visionary usually works. See, you, you have to understand that you are not building a future, a shelter for yourself. You hope that you are building a shelter for the future.